I'm Professor David Wilson. As a criminologist, I'm often asked, what's it like to interview a murderer? Um, as you can see here, everything in this room is audio taped. To answer this question, I'm going to take you on a journey into the dark heart of the police interrogation room. Using cutting edge lip sync technology, we'll bring to life the actual tape confessions of some of the world's most notorious killers. I put tape on her mouth, help that there so she couldn't breathe. And bring you face to face with evil. I felt sick looking at him, knowing what he did. And along with forensic psychologist, Professor Michael Brooks, I'll analyze their interviews in unparalleled detail. Her skull gave way a little bit. She was there immediately unconscious. Their wicked words, now seen spoken for the very first time, will never be forgotten. So I didn't suggest to him that we kill her on Sunday, but I knew that she, I knew that she had to be gone. The killers in today's episode represent what can be described as the banality of evil. How ordinary men and women can conspire to commit the most heinous of crimes as part of the rhythm of their everyday lives. They were two brothers who made a pact to help the one rid the other of what he believed to be his now burdensome lover in a bid to stop her exposing their two year affair. The brothers spent at least a month plotting to kill 34-year-old Samina Imam, buying poisonous metals and identifying a shallow grave to hide her body before carrying out the killing. They smothered Samina to death by pressing a chloroform-soaked tea towel over her mouth and later dumping her body at an allotment owned by one of the brothers, where a sign hung on a shed read, don't wind me up. I'm running out of places to hide the bodies. The interviews are fascinating because we get two accounts of the crime from a shared but different perspective. But as is always the case, when the story is constructed from a lie, there will always be deviations and the truth will find its way out. And despite the loyalties the brothers had to each other, there were always going to be a weaker party, someone who would crack under the pressure of the police interviewing room. These interviews may not have the showmanship attached to one with a famed serial killer, but they do explore the down and dirty end of police work where the interviewing detectives have to extract as much information as they can to build up a picture of the crime. Who were these murderous brothers who believed that blood was thicker than water? David and Roger Cooper. In January 2015, brothers Roger and David Cooper were being questioned by the police in the Midlands about the disappearance of a beautiful, hard-working young woman called Samina Imam. David, um, obviously the purpose for today for, for speaking to you, it's in connection with a missing person inquiry, okay. a lady by the name of Samima Imam. Do you know her? I've seen a photo of you. I've yeah. Seen, I Is that the photo I've got down there? Yeah. yeah. That's, that's a picture of the, the lady that's missing that we're making inquiries about. Okay, right. Have you ever met her? Familiar, I've met twice. Yeah. And do, do you know her by that name? No, I never knew her. Yeah. Did you know her by any name? No. No. When they showed David Cooper a picture of Samina, he recognised her. He didn't know her name and he didn't really know a lot about her, but he did recognise her as the woman his brother had been having a relationship with. And can you tell me what you know about her? Um, she works with my brother. 
Roger Cooper had a relationship with Samina at the Costco where they both worked. He was her manager and she worked on the floor. They'd been actually seeing each other for quite a while. She was hoping that basically he would free himself from his, his other relationship and they would move forward together and just have a nice life together. Am I right in thinking that you met her on two occasions? Yeah. When, when, was, when was the first one? I've seen her in the warehouse. Working. Um, Did you talk to her? No. What they were doing wasn't on the radar. Were you aware that he was seeing her before he came to the restaurant? No. So that was, was that the first time then he'd ever seen or heard anything about her? He might have mentioned. He's not the most loyal person. There might have been a couple that he's talked about. He was also having an affair with another woman and he had a long-term partner, so she was just one of three. When Samina came to him and gave him an ultimatum that he needed to leave his other partners and be exclusive to her, he was worried that he was, would lose his job. He's got a nice job, he likes it, nice car, and he perceives that she threatens all of that and he's vulnerable to her exposing him basically, you know, having this affair. And so he decided to actually take that ultimate choice and end someone else's life to maintain his own. It's, it's a disgusting crime. I'm joined by Professor Michael Brooks. In his long and illustrious career as a prison psychologist, Michael has sat and listened to many murderers and experienced firsthand the mind games they'll play. Can I assume you're going to be discreet? Okay, Michael, the murder of Samina Imam. How typical is this of murder in this country as opposed to those things that we see in dramas? I think it's very difficult um, to categorise any murder as typical. There's many reasons why people murder. And in this particular case, it's, it's how does the male respond to the female um, seemingly to want to expose the affair? Most killings are actually done by people who know each other. There is usually a motive. When we talk about serial killers, we're getting the, the, the other end of the spectrum. We're getting the, the, the plan murders. But with the Coopers, theirs was a planned murder. And that's unusual for people to go to that trouble to kill somebody that he was getting rid of. As in most situations where you get one person involved in a relationship with another, the party that is still alive becomes prime suspect. And the police very quickly during investigations at Costco and with other employees and friends, soon found out that there was a relationship and an affair going on. So straight away, once that information had been ascertained, they were looking directly at Roger Cooper because they knew that socially and emotionally, Sam was so involved with him and besotted by him in many ways that this was going to be down to his actions. Start with it the last day you saw it. It was around 4 p.m., but I haven't got that specific time, so it was around 4 p.m. I was in my office, in the work. There were four of us in the room, so there's two other people apart from her. One of them is another regional manager, which is what she has been doing. Yeah. And the other one works for me in the, in the store. And I was leaving, so I gave the regional manager a hug because it's Christmas. Yeah. And yeah, wished her a happy Christmas. And Sam says, where's mine then? So I went over there and gave her a hug. And so I'll talk to you later. And then I left. Okay. And that was at 4 p.m.? Roughly, if roughly no, around right. 4 p.m. Yeah. On the which day was Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve. The interview between Roger Cooper and the police is really unusual because at this stage, Samina is only missing and they don't really know much else. And when the police question him, Roger starts to get really emotional in a way that you wouldn't expect from someone who is only being interviewed as a witness and as someone who is led to believe that Samina has just vanished. Within five minutes, I'm sure it's within five minutes, she phoned. Okay, she's phoned you. What did you say? She just say that. So I'll see you tonight then. Like, no, I'm not going to be there. She's just trying to persuade me one more time. 
he seems to be crying and, and, and wailing, but then he's able to suddenly break into little explanations of what happens, and then he goes back into his wailing and, and moaning. I think he's putting on a bit of an act there. What happened there? It was a, a two-minute conversation, if that. It was a brief one. How did, she, how did it leave it? How did she sound? A little disappointed, but I think she still thought I was going to go. So not as angry as or as irked as she probably should have. You say the call lasted about two minutes. Um, was that the last time you heard from her? No, I had my text messages when I heard her voice. Now, this particular clip is interesting to me because Roger Cooper is crying throughout this particular sequence in which he's being interviewed about Samina's supposed disappearance at this point. What are these crocodile tears telling you? How should we interpret hit the fact that Roger Cooper is crying? Well, we know not only from Roger Cooper, but from other instances where partners have murdered um, their, their spouse or their, 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 their loved one, that actually when it comes to a TV or a media appearance, they put on the pretense of being concerned and become overly emotional. And then you get the mismatch between the emotion that they're displaying and the words that they're saying, and you don't get that, that, that correlation. So the fact that he's being overly emotional might well cause the police to thinking, actually, this, this doesn't marry, this, this doesn't match up and therefore it arouses suspicions and wanting to inquire further. Is empathy what we're seeing here? Is Roger Cooper crying a vain attempt for him to strike uh, a tragic note so that the detective will want to empathise with his situation? Well, if not empathise, at least to um, have sympathy for him. When we look at Roger Cooper's interview, he clearly is acting out the role he thinks he ought to be acting. This is a man who is dumping his uh, lover, didn't want anything to do with her, and yet here he is now showing more grief than you would expect. That I find quite, well, understandable, because if you're trying to act gr grief, then people tend to go over the top and do too much grieving, and it becomes very clear they're acting it. Well, tell me about the text message here. This is, a couple of hours later, nearer seven o'clock. I can read it, do you read it? Yeah, 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 go ahead. I'm fuming full stop. I'm going to where I am truly cared for. What do you think she meant from by that text message? Oh, she, she'd gone to Birmingham to see one of her friends. It was an assumption. I've got no basis for that at all. Because I knew that she would want to eventually be in London to see her family because of her mum. Because I knew that she would want to eventually be in London to see her family because of... It's not just the emotion. This is somebody who claims, you know, he, he's the manager of Costco. Samina works at Costco. They've got hundreds of employees. And he says, well, you know, I didn't really know her that well. And then suddenly he goes into quite a amount of detail about text messages that he's received. So there's a mismatch, not just in his emotion, but also in relation to the information that he's providing. Absolutely, and those, so those are the behavioral indicators that interviewers can use um, to recognise that somebody may not be telling the truth. And you hold on to that and you let them tell the story and then you go back and, and follow those things up. They also assumed, again, and this shows his arrogance, that Samina had not told anybody that they were having an affair. And he relied on that when, in fact, of course she told somebody. So, again, it shows that arrogance um, and, and also a naivety in terms of just what it takes to plan and commit a murder successfully. As the Cooper brothers' questioning continued, the police began to notice small but significant differences in their stories. Roger Cooper had an emotional and detailed account about when he had last seen Samina. Too detailed, too emotional in the eyes of the police. David Cooper, on the other hand, was claiming he didn't even know who Samina Imam really was. As the pair were being interviewed, other detectives were trawling through their mobile phone histories. One phone linked to David Cooper revealed messages in code, including Star Wars-related phrases such as Death Star Complete and Stay on Target. 
detectives rightly interpreted these texts as referring to Miss Imam's abduction and murder. Recognizing that David Cooper was the weaker of the pair, detectives started to apply more pressure on him. This is a tactic when properly applied can have a great effect, especially when detectives keep the person being questioned in the dark about what their alleged accomplices have said. The day that Samila died, she left work at around four o'clock. Investigators know that by looking at the data on her phone. She made a call to her family about 4.30. And according to what the analysts found on her phone, she traveled up to Leicester in the same car that Roger had driven to his brothers. Roger had denied to the hill that Samina was with him that day. And he had said that he had gone to his brothers alone to drop off a Christmas present. David also backed up his story and said that his brother had arrived alone. After we went, you just literally gone a minute and the door knocked again. I thought it was him coming back. So I've opened the door because normally I wouldn't open the door. I don't like people. And um, it was this woman who I knew to be an associate of my brother's. Um, for reasons that I've mentioned before and will happily go into again later. In my mind, for my own reasons, I imagined she was looking for him and I knew that he wanted to go home and I knew that he didn't know, want her knowing where he lived. And she was like, where's Roger? Like, stepping in the house. I was like, he's not here, he's gone. And she was like, I haven't seen him leave. And I was like, well, I'll call him. He's just left. And she was like, walking through the house. And she was like, where's Roger? Michael. This is an interesting stage because David Cooper has begun to spill the beans about what actually happened. And the grubby, sordid reality is becoming all too clear. I think there are two things that we'll probably discuss further. Firstly, this is a murder that involves two people, two brothers. And classically, we call this a folie a deux a madness shared by two. I think I would contend that this was a folie d'oeuvre. It was very deliberate, it was very planned. There were a number of attempts to take her life. So they knew exactly what they were doing. If an element of madness occurs, it will be because of a crime of passion. Somebody finding themselves in a situation that they can't cope with and spontaneously reacting in a very violent and hostile way. This wasn't. It was very planned, it was very deliberate, and the brothers both knew what they were doing. It is surprisingly unusual. I would expect to be brothers in a gang or some family dynamics where the brothers get together to kill the father or the mother for financial reasons. I don't know many cases where two brothers have conspired to kill the other brother's ex-lover. Very often, in the majority of cases, if you have co-conspirators, there is a feeding of confidence that's a kind of reciprocity and that you grow in confidence because you're sharing this process and you kind of test it out with each other. You say, should we do this, should we do that? And, there's, and the, kind of, the more that grows in a collusive kind of uh, conspiratorial sense, the stronger it gets. Family ties, blood ties are very strong, no doubt about it, and usually we'll do anything we can to protect the people around us who were related to. I think they actually gave each other a great deal of support. Um, there was clearly loyalty between them, and making that decision to, to plan the murder shows, A, the bond between them, but also the mindset that these two men had, their superiority, their arrogance. They actually agreed that this was a sensible course of action. Of course, what you don't know and what you can't predict is how long, especially once you get intense pressure from the police, how long that tight bond will remain and who is going to crack first. So I got her to sit on the sofa and um, after a cup of tea then she wasn't interested. She was moaning, um, I don't recall what she was saying, but she was like, we've made plans, um, he's supposed to be seeing me, things like this, which I I'm just going to be vague about. She wasn't accepting that cup of tea. She wasn't accepting anything else. So I was like, got to let him get away. This sounds really silly, but I was like, okay. 
So the other thing that will come out, I think, in terms of our discussion is the sense that this is a British police interview technique, the peace model being used in these police interviews. And separating the two brothers is a very good tactic, is it not? The advantage for the police of interviewing two people separately is that neither of the interviewees knows what the other is saying. So they're immediately in a position of, of some uncertainty. They're immediately in a position where they can't control the information that's coming out because there's somebody else who's being interviewed and they might say something that um, contradicts what they're saying. So the advantage is always with the police in those situations. And crucially, the difference between the peace model and the read technique is that a British detective would not be able to lie in these interviews, whereas they would be allowed to lie in North America. And in many ways, if you're not lying, that gives you a much greater strength within the interview process just as offenders sometimes find it difficult to maintain a lie, so it can be the same for the, for the police. So if you're truthful at all times, you've got nothing to, to try and remember what you've said before, you've got nothing to correlate your statements against, you can just be completely honest. People do not rehearse the entire scenario. They stop prematurely leaving themselves vulnerable to detection. It's extraordinary how often that happens. Because it's an imperfect plotting protocol, uh, inevitably they will not be able to sustain identical defenses. And once they diverge, it makes it easier for the interviewers and the investigators to press home the advantage with the weaker of the two. Each side starts panicking about what the other one said, especially if they've had no time to arrange their story. They're also thinking about how their lives are unravelling. So they're having to not only maintain the deception and try and protect themselves from being found out, but they're also understandably panicking what that, that's going to mean in terms of their lives, their relationships, their liberty. All of that is going on at the same time, so it's extraordinarily stressful. The pressure of the interview room and the burden of guilt would prove too much for David Cooper. After hours of questioning, he finally reveals how Samina Imam's life was ended. It's an appalling description of a young woman's death. The delivery is almost robotic, the detail matter of fact. Cooper is describing the murder of an innocent young woman as though he's reading from a laundry list. The extraordinary being made banal and inconsequential. Murder reduced to the commonplace. This lady, I didn't know her name. Um, she died on my sofa. Okay, so um, my brother had been round. Um, I've already made a statement to that effect and I have a feeling that statement is true except anything that might implicate myself. So we can go back to that. I collect lots of different odds and pieces in my house. You'll find lots of things and they found lots of things and none of it makes sense to lots of people but to me it's interesting. And so in my kitchen I've got an ammo box, a military ammo tin, which I think is normal. And um, in that I had um, a pot of chloroform. I've seen it on telly and I thought it was okay. I thought I'll just shut her up because um, my walls are paper thin, don't want a scene and I want to give Roger a few minutes. I got the chlorophyll, I poured it over a tea towel, my sofa is right next to the doorway and I just went in and put it across her face thinking that it would come out. And um, I kind of put it on her face, sat on her lap, arms went up and I grabbed her arms and I forced them down and I was like, just a couple of breaths. And I thought, okay, I thought, I'll just shut her up. A number of themes interest me from the clip. The chloroform, for one, did that strike you as almost a, a kind of memory of school days? Well, certainly of films that you saw in the 50s and 60s of how to kill somebody. Well, I'm remembering biology lessons from um, my own school where, you know, the effects of chloroform on small animals was the, the point. It did seem to, again, reveal very little about how well they had thought this through. 
how well they had planned things. Well, these are two un unsophisticated individuals in terms of um, criminal behaviour. So they were just working out how best to kill somebody and dispose of the body, but in very sort of e elementary ways. What I find interesting is the fact they had chloroform. It's not a, a chemical that you normally expect to find in the home. You find it in, in laboratories, you find it in factories, but you wouldn't expect to find it in somebody's kitchen. So did he borrow it from work? Did he get it uh, off the internet? But either way, it gives the intention there was some intent to kill, or at least harm her. The use of chloroform in any type of murderous situation is rare, and she was taken back to a house, a property in Leicester, where she was suffocated, but use of chloroform. And you can imagine the discomfort that the poor lady must have been feeling because she was burnt badly around the mouth because the chloroform, the, the, the acids in it and the chemicals in it aren't good for human skin. And of course she died as a result of that. David eventually confessed that he had killed Samina and this was really unusual and really shocking to the police because they had been focusing on Roger. They believed that he had much more motive and he had much more of an opportunity to kill her than his brother did. David Cooper, I find his behaviour extremely odd, this total lack of any emotions, and he was very factual, very boringly spoken. He could have been talking about a cricket match or something like that. There was no sense of any remorse, no sense of anxiety, n not even any rationalising his behaviour or disassociating. It was simply, I did this X, Y and Z. End of story. Again, something that strikes me about the Cooper brothers, one was six foot five, one was six foot seven, Samina Imam was only five foot four. There's a huge disparity in terms of their size, their bulk. Why would the Coopers get themselves into a position that they thought that the best way of handling the complexity of their lives in relation to her was to kill her? I think Roger Cooper was the primary driver and he managed to convince his brother to come along and assist him. So the question is, why did David go along with that? I think you see evidence of David being the weaker brother, if sort of psychologically. Um, speaking in terms of the fact that he was the one that um, broke down in interview. He, he was the one that, that told the story. Let's listen to the next clip and then let's work out what happens to her after the chloroform has been placed over her mouth. We both picked up, I think, that he's claiming he didn't intend to kill her. That's one of those things we describe as a technique of neutralization. That was from, from David. That may not have been Roger's intention. So let's hear what happens to her after she's been chloroformed in the flat in Leicester. Chloroform, it was freezing cold on my hand. It was like burning, it, that doesn't happen on TV. It was all wrong, it was all wrong. I knew it was wrong straight away. The naive as it sounds, I did think that it would just buy me some time because I don't know how long they stay unconscious for. She didn't wake up. And I, I, I tried, you know what I mean? I felt the pulse. I didn't clean the sofa, I didn't do anything to hide anything, I just covered my tracks. I get caught, I get caught, I'm not gonna try too hard. And then, um, you know, maybe I'll ring Roger and tell him, maybe, but I don't know, I don't know. You know, maybe I'll ring Roger and tell him, maybe, but I don't know, I don't know. Well, uh, a lot going on here that's worth unpacking. The first, for me, are the what criminologists would call techniques of neutralization, when the offender, the perpetrator, wants to downplay what he or she might have done. In this case, it was a terrible accident that they didn't set out to murder Samina. That simply isn't true. Well, that may have been the case for David. We, we, we don't know. Perhaps Roger had um, persuaded him to come along and David hadn't worked through the consequences of what the action was going to be, whereas Roger had. What happened thereafter is quite unique in as much as these two brothers who had planned this, this wasn't something that was just 
a fleeting moment, let's have a quick telephone call and discuss it. These two brothers then concocted this whole ruse where they manipulated the crime scene, if you like. They moved her car to Coventry, so everything was in place and it looked like Sam had just naturally disappeared. I thought, right, right, no one knows she's here. Right, it's that easy. So um, I went for a bag, the keys were there, and I was like, right. Move the car back to Coventry and no one will know. Strangely, there's a side point which has been talked about a lot, but um, my brother had hired a car for me. Um, he'd hired a van for me to move house. We'd both move it at the same time. But when I drop it off, I left it um, parked on the residential street near to where my brother works. My brother works in Costco's. The rest of my story is about moving the car. You guys pretty much already know. Because I panicked because I couldn't have to leave it in Coventry because it was too close to Roger. So, um, driving her car back to Coventry. I've done a lot of driving and I'd use different routes every time. Stalled it on the motorway. I've got police attention. I can tell you more details. Like, and it was just a complete nightmare and I just had to do it. For a few days, they drove around with the body and they would eventually take Mina's car and place it in the Luton airport so it looked as though she had vanished of her own accord. Meanwhile, they were trying to find a way in which to dispose of the body. With the police denied an admission to Samina's murder, the case must go to court. During the Cooper's trial, Excerpts of the police interviews were played. The jury was unanimous in their verdict, life imprisonment. Judge Patrick Thomas QC told the siblings, you work together, hand in glove, in planning and carrying out the murder of a joyful and bubbly young woman, brutally betrayed by a man she loved and his brother. Of all the cases in this series, this appears on the surface to be the most straightforward. But as I believe the police interviews reveal, the callous and calculating nature of the brothers and their cruel means of murder mark them out as extremely dangerous men who afford no value to anyone else's lives apart from their own. So I've got back home. I've got this thing to hide. Sorry, I'm, I'm not going to refer to it as anything. You sure would. During that interview, he was very crude and he was very callous about the way he spoke about Samina, and that made police a little bit suspicious. Okay, so at my house, there's a sleeping bag cover without a sleeping bag. Well, I, I put it in my sleeping bag. David Cooper's police interview showed a, a total lack of respect of the victim. He talked about, I had to dispose of the thing and he talks about taking the thing in the car and then on trying to dispose of a body uh, in a vegetable patch and things like this. No sense of uh, guilt, no sense of remorse or anything else at all. Very cold, very uh, unemotional. So I know a guy and he's got a van. I rang him from a disposal SIM card. Did we catch that? So somebody came on Christmas Eve? Yeah. yeah. Christmas Eve took it away from me. So you rang him from a disposal SIM card? Yeah. I don't know what happened next. Um, I think it's buried in Woodland. He doesn't tell the police where the body is. He starts to make up stories about uh, a man called Ben who took the body off to the woods. Um, and I cannot understand why he went from a full admission to telling lies again. I think it's thorny ground here. I, the courts tend to um, turn a blind eye to stories that have been told to the police. Um, it's sometimes never even brought out in court and um, it's not an offence to lie to police. It wasn't in his interest to do it, um, whether he, was, he wasn't shielding his brother, it was just uh, perhaps it's part of his fantasy makeup. I'm not from Leicester, I don't know Leicester which is why I've been driving around a lot of space recently, but um, I think he said something about Swithland Woods, but I've never heard of Swithland Woods, I don't know where it is. You have to think of the time wasted. He gave um, the name of a wood, which could have involved the use of 20 officers on over so how many days searching an area where the guy knew she never was. I might have just made that up. 
Switzerland woods? Switzerland. I don't even know. Right. So this idea about how to dispose of the body is one of the things when working with murderers, when talking with murderers, there's always this issue about what do you do with the body after you've killed. And it shows their unsophistication in that they hadn't worked that out beforehand. And therefore driving around with her in the car, in the boot of the car, um, is another example of how they hadn't thought this through. And probably in a sense of some panic, trying to think through actually how best do we now sort of get ourselves out of the situation that we find, find ourselves in. We hadn't realised it was going to be like this. The rest of my story is about moving the car. What they don't realise, of course, is that all of this is caught on traffic cameras and the police are able to put all of his movements together and they can see what he's been doing. They're able to confront him with that and eventually David then tries to say he'd killed Samina by accident. Which, of course, doesn't really wash at all. But at the same time, it's another um, example of David trying to cover for his brother. One inexplicable uh, aspect of the whole case is why does David take so much responsibility for this crime for a woman he'd met perhaps a couple of times? So he must have had an extraordinary bond with his brother, or perhaps his brother had a hold over him. What they then did was wrap the body up and take it to an allotment in Leicester where it was buried. In, in the grounds. These two brothers, Roger and David, they're very, very overbearing personalities and they were big, overwhelmingly big, which is why they'd work so well together. David, who seems to have done most of the dirty work for his brother, rather inexplicably, buries the body on his allotment. He's then tasked with moving her car, which he does several times. It was here that investigators excavated the ground and found her remains. Michael, I'm totally intrigued that the body ends up in David's allotment. And I'm intrigued by that because of the sign on the allotment door. I noted down what it said. It said, don't wind me up. I'm running out of places to hide the bodies. He's obviously had that sign on his shed for a number of days or weeks or, or, or years. And perhaps it was just remembers that thinking, well, actually, well, what do, do we, what do we do with the body? Well, how about using the shed? I always get to this position, though, where I think, there's no such thing as coincidences. And I, I really worry about the sign, if the sign is um, coincidental or if the sign is revealing a desperate desire by David to draw attention to the fact that what he's done is wrong and a body is actually buried there. So it depends when, it, when he put the sign up. Was it before or was it after the murder? A friend of David's came forward after he had been arrested and told the police that before his arrest he had given her a set of keys and one of these keys was to his allotment and police were really eager to go and have a look around because they had not been able to find anything that tied the brothers into the murder. It was all circumstantial evidence for the time being and when they went to the allotment they noticed that there was a sheet of tarpaulin that had leaves all in the center, there was no debris around the edges. It looked as if it had been lifted from the ground. And so when they investigated, they found a mound of soil that looked fresh and it had footprints in it. And it wasn't until it was excavated over a number of days that they found Samina's body. This was an incredibly botched. I mean, the body was 
extremely easy to find and just barely concealed. It was very poorly thought through. Well, I don't know how they thought through it at all. Again, this is a case where all of their attention seems to have been on the successful commission of the act rather than the consequences in terms of avoiding uh, arrest and conviction. For you, when you think about the Cooper brothers, what would be your summary? What would be your conclusion about them? Simply that um, Roger made the decision that he didn't want one of his lovers to expose the relationship, that his way of solving that was to um, kill her, and that he persuaded his brother to come along and assist. And so the person that's dominant within this relationship is Roger, despite how he presents himself um, to the police in interview, and the person who's subservient in their relationship is indeed his brother, David. It's a painful story because she didn't deserve that, obviously. I mean, who does? But she, she's a lovely person. She's, she's not an enemy of Roger's. She's hoping to have a happy life with him. And yet, he, he comes up with this grubby, miserable, stupid plot to kill her. And then they get caught very quickly, and it's all been for nothing. And all that's left is all the heartache and misery for her family. It was all about him and, and maintaining his lifestyle, protecting his credibility for what it was. And that shows in the, in the execution of the crime and the, the lack of thought around looking at it from other people's perspectives. The fact that he didn't even consider whether anyone else knew, again, just demonstrates to me that this is a man who is used to treating women terribly, not valuing them, objectifying them, and using them for his own means. So Michael, the murder of Samina Imam, is that murder the grubby reality of murder in this country? It's certainly tragic, and there are a number of different um, categories of, of murder, of um, reasons for murder, and one of those is to dispose of um, a partner who is likely to embarrass you. And for me, what comes across strongly in terms of the pattern of murder in this country is just how often it is that men kill women. This is about misogyny. This is about the reality in this country, even today, that two women a week will die at the hands of their partners or ex-partners. And, and we know that men commit the majority of crimes, offences in this country. They commit the majority of murders. They commit the majority of violent offences. And they commit the, the majority of assaults within relationships. In the end, David and Roger Cooper refused to tell the truth about how Samina died. And by that fact, continue to display no remorse for her death. Their guile and planning masked by a desperate display to be ordinary is all too evident in their interviews with the police. And the recordings act as a sober reminder that evil lurks within the most ordinary of men, who when they lose control of their lies and their lives, can be driven to the most heinous of all human acts, the murder of an innocent woman. It worries me that I believe they are examples of a surprisingly large group of men who are of similar ilk in that they are adulterous and lying and they have relatively elastic or underdeveloped consciences. They're promiscuous, they're opportunistic and um, their primary drive is self-gratification. And um, I suspect that there isn't a great distance between them and circumstantially a number of others. But what separated them was at some point they decided that killing was better 
than confessing or letting his wife know that he had been unfaithful. And there's the rub. I don't understand how they could reason that that was the better course.